Um, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us tonight for our seventh and final um, expert lecture of the series and so far we've had some really amazing speakers and I have no doubt that tonight is not going to be an exception to what we've experienced so far. So um, before we start we've got a little bit of housekeeping to, to get through. So um, first of all tonight's webinar will be uh, recorded for publicity purposes. And I'll ask that um, attendees, if you have any questions, can you please write them in the Q&A function? Um, and at the end of the presentation, I will direct the questions that are in the Q&A to Professor Byers here. Um, if you have any technical issues, can you please use the chat function? Um, and of course, the, the excellent team of, of Vinay and Erica will be able to sort you out too sweet so that you don't miss a moment of tonight's presentation. Um, and at the end, there will be a, a satisfaction poll. So we'd be uh, really grateful if you could stay on and you wouldn't mind doing that for us. It's a couple of questions and it really helps us get um, a lot better in this space. Um, so from a housekeeping perspective, that's, that's that. And uh, now I would like to um, introduce tonight's speaker. And not only is Professor Byers uh, an expert in the healthy ageing space, but I'm also very proud to say that she is a colleague and a friend of mine. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about her. So Professor Laurie Bynes is a social gerontologist with an uh, extensive experience in active ageing, social sustainability and responsibility. Professor Byers has led the Infrastructure for Sustainable Communities theme and the Institute for Future Environments at QUT. And she is also the current Director of Healthy Aging Initiative at UQ, which is an initiative developing network designed to build a community of practice around healthy aging, incorporating research and community engagement. And she has a strong track record of bringing together diverse researchers to create transdisciplinary teams in uh, really quite amazing sectors such as energy, smart city, senior living, um, and these have all delivered high impact outcomes. Professor Byers has extensive experience in community engagement programs and evaluations, and through these strong collaborative partnerships, um, has a wide variety of community, industry, and government organizations investigating the dynamics and impacts of aging within communities and examining issues such as quality of life engagement and well-being. In particular, she led a community wellness review for a major Australian developer and was the lead investigator on an ARC, which is an Australian Research Council initiative, developing inter intergenerational parks designed for active and engaged communities and an ARC linkage, again, in the Australian Research Council. So these are large grants like national um, research grants in, in Singapore. Um, so the ARC linkage was reviewing community livability and the impact on social connectedness and active ageing. So without further ado, I would like you to join me in warmly welcoming tonight's speaker, Professor Laurie Bynes. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'm, you're, um, you and your team did some great research. <laughs> I didn't know you knew all that. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, Thanks for having me today. It's, um, I'm so excited to be here. I'm going to share my screen and unless Karen, you say anything, I'll assume that the screen sharing was successful. So. Yep, you're, you're perfect. Perfect, well, let's get started. So um, to start out today, you guys know a lot about aging, healthy aging and so forth. You're, you know, some of you are researchers, your academics, your practitioners, and so forth. So today, I'm probably not going to tell you anything new. I'm not, but what I am going to do is challenge the way we've seen things that we've always known. So really, I just want to challenge your thinking a little bit, stir the pot. Um, if you disagree with me, that's fantastic. We can have a bit of a robust discussion because I think that's what... Um, really um, extending our thinking is, is, is all about. But before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the First Nations owners of the lands on where we all meet in Australia and pay respects to our elders, laws, customs and creation spirits 
And we recognize that these lands have been teaching places of teaching, research, and learning. And we acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders play within the community within Australia. So let's get started. So the world is constantly changing. I don't think anyone will debate about that. Um, in 1998, that was when um, Google was born and only 60% of people had mobile phones. Fast forward to 2020, 90% um, of people use the internet. Google is a verb. A lot of people have smart phones. So the world has really changed in the space of 22 years. But, and in the demographic shifts in Australia, so I'll just give you a little bit of a snapshot in Australia. In 1909, the life expectancy was 53 and the pension age was 65. So 20, uh, the 1970, but look at 19, uh, look at 2020. The life expectancy is 83 years, but look at the pension age. That hasn't changed. It's still 60, well, it's changed by two years. It's still 67, which is very interesting. And then 2050 is expected to be, um, life expectancies be up around 87. So who knows what pension ages it's going to be. But what's really interesting is that between 1909, when we set the pension age at 65, when life expectancy was 53, we have a 30-year bonus between then and now. And it's a 30-year bonus for a lot of people. So, that, and nothing has changed in terms of age of retirement or pension age. We just didn't see longevity coming and we didn't prepare for it. So if you look back in 20, in, uh, back at the turn of um, when the 2000s started, we knew the average retirement age was at 60. And a lot of us that were around at that stage were talking about dementia, cognitive decline, depression, mobility. But we didn't know how many people were working over 65. And we didn't know how many training programs there were for people over 65 or how many people were unemployed over 65. Fast forward to 2020, we know that the retirement age is, is 63. People are retiring a little bit later. We're still talking about aged care, dementia, elder abuse, care burden, pension, social isolation. And what, guess what? We still don't know how many people are working. We don't know about training programs and we still don't know how many people are unemployed rather than retired. So we haven't actually changed what we're thinking. And that's resulted in a lot of discussion in the world not being ready for people living a lot longer. We just did not see longevity coming. So I think it's fair to say one thing's for sure. If we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. One definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. And that's kind of what we're doing right now. We're talking about the same stuff and we're expecting different results. So you need to think that through. So longevity, um, when I'm talking about longevity, I'm talking about living, learning, working and playing, basically through your whole life. And longevity is basically going to be one of the greatest drivers of innovation in the next 20 years, because longevity is going to extend, it's not going to get shorter, we're just, we're gonna end up living longer. So we need to be ready for longer lives and change the way we think about that longer life. So the challenge is how we look through the lens of longevity and how do we best leverage the extra 30 years of life? But to think about that, we actually need to think about how we got to where we are in 2021 when we're not ready for longevity. So what kind of has set the foundation for how we see the world? So in Australia and also at the WHO and UN everywhere, people talk about the age dependency ratio. And this is used internationally to look at the number of non-working people supported by working age people. So it's people less than 15 years old and then people greater than 65. And that's the burden falling on working age people in order to provide for non-working age people. So what is interesting that's embedded in that age dependency ratio 
is the assumption that nobody over 65 works, that people over 65 are a burden, and that people 65 plus need to be cared for. So that basically people over 65 years are dependent. So what's really interesting is that if you have a birthday, if you're when you're 64, you're actually productive. The day you have that birthday, you flip right into being categorized as dependent. So how we that's how we view different age groups. So we actually look at children, and children are dependent. But we all talk about children being our future, and children are our future, absolutely. Um, and we build an awful lot of infrastructure for children. So we build schools, we build playgrounds, sporting. We just do, if you think about all the different inf infrastructure that we build for kids, it's to set them up and give them a great future. And then we look at the 15 to 64 year olds. They're the productive members of society. And again, there's a lot of infrastructure that we build for workers, such as transport, public transport roads, um, housing, you name it. We build a lot of stuff to keep people working. Then we have your 65 plus. They're dependent, but they aren't seen as our future. What is really interesting, I don't know if um, around the world, but in, certainly in Australia, no one ever talks about an 85 year old being Australia's future. Um, or, or 65 year old. So we don't actually necessarily build infrastructure for people over 65. In Australia, if you think about infrastructure for older people, it's aged care facilities and retirement villages, and that's about it. So it's the whole the infrastructure is all around just care and for dependency. So we don't build any other infrastructure to keep people engaged. So where did this come from? Well, the early aging theories you guys will all be familiar with, so I won't spend a lot of time on them. But the first one, if you remember, was disengagement theory. And that was about withdrawing from meaningful roles in society. Then came along activity theory and continuity theory. Now, I'm going to argue that dis disengagement actually hasn't, um, we haven't really moved on from that, even though we might say that we have, I'm going to argue that we haven't. Then we had the more comprehensive aging um, frameworks, and you guys will all be familiar with them. There's successful aging, which has a health and medical focus, productive aging, which is around employment activities and retirement. But you probably know that that one hasn't had a lot of airplay. Active aging, which is health participation and security, and then healthy aging, which is health and wellness. So there's health all the way through and quite a bit of um, medical as well. Now, disengagement theory, that came into in 1961. And according to disengagement theory, aging is inevitable, mutual withdrawal or disengagement resulting in decreased interaction between the aging person and others in the social system he belongs to. Of course, that was back in 1961. And um, so it was all about he, but it is, um, according to this theory, it is natural and acceptable for older people to withdraw from society. Now, I'm not sure we've moved on from that. And I will give you the uh, latest email from my bank. This came to me, my first name is actually Eleanor. I'm Eleanor Laurie. So this came to me and it said, Eleanor, simple steps to retire on your term. What will Eleanor time look like in retirement? So this comes to me. I get a, I get a, a, um, a notice from my bank and I get one from, from superannuation, probably quarterly. So I'm asked when I'm going to retire quarterly and have done since I turned 50. So um, this sends to me that I'm going to play golf for the rest of my life, and which will be kind of interesting because I've actually never played golf before ever. But um, I guess that's what I'm going to do when um, when I get to retire. So, also the other thing that when we look at aging, if you look at the theories, aging is medical and health. 
um, they're, they're often connected in Australia, the aging is in, in with the, the health and medical quite regularly. And that leads to most of the conversations being around care. Um, a lot of our conversations around how much care we give to older people and older people needing care and so forth. And in Australia, a lot of the, um, the care is also around the more care we give, the better we are. So we give care and we're rewarded for care. So the carer is seen as a really good person who helps these poor people who need assistance and we care for them. And I'm gonna argue that that's a bit of a, a concern because it's not support, it's care and it's care. The more care you give, the better off that, that the carer is seeing. Now there's a theory that, um, there's a lot of theories we could actually have a look at, but I just wanna pull up symbolic interactionism. And, and that's when we develop our identities through social interactions, and we modify our, our identity as interactions with others and situations change. So basically, as we interact with each other, our identities will change and, and we modify that as we go along. And, kind of peer pressure and a few other things happen. So, you know, it's where our identity does develop and change over time. Now, the other theory I wanna bring into this conversation is affordance theory. Affordance theory comes from this design area. And what affordance theory talks about is that the world is perceived not only in terms of shapes and relationships, but also what opportunities for actions are provided. So if you look up here in this picture, you can see that there's a bench and a walkway. So we know clearly from here that you're allowed to sit on the bench, That's it's given you that space and you're allowed to walk on the walkway. But if you have a look back here in the green space, there's nobody on the grass. So I'm guessing that it's actually not okay to walk on, on the grass so that the affordances tell you to stay on the, on the, the walkway. So affordances are also determined based on our individual and group perceptions. So visual clues indicate what we can or we cannot do in a place. So back in the other picture, you weren't allowed to walk on the green space, but you can see in this picture, that they've got some different things to do up in the grass and they're encouraging you to engage within the grassy spaces. You've got lots of different spaced out um, benches and you've got walkways. So they're encouraging you to engage within that space. But visual clues are very, are very strong telling you what you can and can't do in, in the space that you're in. So our social and our physical environments impact on our, on our identity and how we interact. So let's have a look at what that means. Now, I did some um, research a couple of uh, years ago, and I just want to uh, talk about that. The first one I talk about is we did some um, social media mapping, and we found that basically that the senior living industry, which is aged care, retirement living researchers, it's an industry talking to itself. So we did it again about a year and a half or two years later. And again, it's the same thing. We're talking to ourselves, basically. That's who the conversation is about. And what we found is that, um, that retirement pictures and conversations about retirement is most often occurs with people who are in their 40s and their 50s. And what they're doing is when they talk about it, it's usually when they've had a rotten day. And what they say is, I can, when I retire, I'm going to do this. Um, and it's kind of like what you look, it's what you do. Like I've had a bad day. I just want to think about something else. And this is where you go into that aspirational idea of what your perfect world kind of looks like. So what's interesting is so it is the 40 and 50 year olds, particularly the 50 year olds. And that's normally because they've got, children, they've got parents, and they're managing quite a number of things. But when you get into the 60s and so forth, there's the, the chatter about retirement tends to, tends to um, drop off, which is interesting. 
So we had an online community of 100 people. They ranged from 50 to 90. We did it over four days, 24 hours, constantly talking about various things. Now, what they talked about all, uh, on and on and on was the importance of occupation. So it's basically the importance of purpose and meaning in life. That's what people talked about more than anything else. And they talked about purpose and meaning in terms of being paid or pro bono or volunteering. But it, the main thing was about was what they had to get up each day for. So it was the importance of having that role and engagement every single day. They also talked about work-life balance. That was when people were in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, they talked about work-life balance. So there was a distinct understanding between in their life what was work and what was leisure. They made a, quite a distinct um, understanding, and it was work-life work -life balance. Also, a holiday is just that. It is a holiday. People would go on holidays for a week or two, and then they would come back to their day, which was their daily routine, which had the importance of their occupation and the things that they were doing, which were important in work-life balance. So holidays are important, but they weren't just that holidays. There was also very important conversations around valued and reciprocal relationships. Nobody wanted to be cared for. People wanted to have that reciprocal relationship, that give and that take. Everybody needs care at various points in time in their life. I do, you do, everyone does. But it's actually the importance of being able then to care for others too. So when it's a one-way street and it's care is just one way, that's when people felt really uncomfortable and really weren't happy in terms of only being cared for. It was very important to have those reciprocal relationships where they contributed and were part of that giving and taking. Multi-generational communities were also very important. Uh, of the 100, only about three or four of them wanted to live in retirement villages or aged care. So again, that was about the the, the average of who goes into retirement villages, multi-generational communities were seen as very important. People wanted to get, engage with people of you know, all sorts of people and have a really interesting um, community. So again, the main thing was work-life balance throughout their whole life. And that was regardless of what age they were up until the, the folks they were in their 90s, they were saying the same thing. And then they talked about living in the community. So it was very important for them to have their community networks, very vibrant community environments and livability. So people wanted to live in, in it's basically the same conversation that people have in middle age and, and younger ages. People just wanted to live in communities where it was vibrant and exciting and it, they could engage. So what older adults talked about they talked about love, life, work, all sorts of stuff. I suspect if you actually looked at that, you wouldn't know what age group that was, would you? Because that's what pe people just talk about everyday stuff and things don't change. But if you have a look at it, that's what they talk about and that's what we talk about. There's a big disconnect between what older people talk about and what we talk about and what the industry talks about. So we might need to think about how we actually connect between what that's important to them and actually tap, in, tap into that. So why should we care? Um, we should care because when we use terms like me time or time to relax or let me care for you, that translates to you are no longer capable or product productive and you are no longer of value. And that in retirement is also the traditional meaning of retirement is withdrawing or leaving. And that's directly in line with disengagement theory. So the community's perception of retirement living, aged care, and the care industry in general is directly in line 
with the traditional um, definition of retirement and disengagement. So end of life, withdrawal, and basically death. So what's interesting is that this is how, in some ways, people feel that they're being portrayed by those of us in the industry. So we have to really think about what it is that we're talking about and how we send those messages. And we send them through things that we may not realize. So we talked about the affordance theory and it gives you clues about what you can and can't do. So when you build, we build gates and walls around our retirement villages and aged care facilities, it actually tells the people inside that they can't leave. It tells them that we don't trust you to leave. You're not capable to leave. And it tells people outside is that you're not welcome in here. That these are walls for people to keep people in. And there is a disconnect between those outside and those inside. It sends a very clear message to people about who's to mix with who. This is a, an award-winning, I chose an American one, so I did not set people in Australia or um, in Singapore, but this is an award-winning aged care facility. So on first blush, you might look at that and go, that's beautiful, I'd like to live there. But that actually, if you think about it as a home and what it says about living in a, at, at home, it completely fails as a home. If you look at this, it tells you exactly what you can do. You can't even put up your own new curtains. You fancy if you just put a, um, you know, a towel over that, of the, at that beautiful fence, or you try to dig up the garden and put some flowers in there, or you try to personalize the space and make it your own, or you try to have a, a party or a thing. This, this environment tells you exactly what you need to do. And it also tells you that you will conform to exactly what is going on in that space. There's no room for personalization of that space whatsoever. And again, you might be fun for, for a week, but you, it's not anybody's home. Now, this is innovation in retirement living. This is out of Canada. And um, you can't read the, the, um, the writing, but what they've got is the innovation is, well, there's a, a fancy restaurant down here. There's a cafe where you can see the little umbrellas. There's two towers and then one tower before. And, and in between the two towers, there's a, a duck pond and a barbecue and various things. But the innovation is that walkway that runs between, that runs off that front building. Now, that's a really, um, that's their innovation. So if we think about what affordance theory tells you, what's at the end of that walkway gives a clue as to what is absolutely expected of those residents. So let's think about it. If a university um, in America and Canada, they often have the universities connected with the aged care and retirement living. So if a university is at the other end of that, that walkway, what you'll have is that a clear expectation that those residents will engage in the university. They'll, be, they'll participate in classes, they might tutor, they, um, they might participate in research, they might do all sorts of really cool things with the university. So if on the other side of that walkway, is a, an office building, then again, um, there would be an expectation that people would participate in do some work or engage in, in, the, in those activities. If it's a shopping center, again, their participate is um, either working or consumers or so forth. But what's at the other end of that walkway is a hospital. So think about what having a hospital says to everybody who's living in that tower. And basically what it says, the affordance that it also says to the families who come and eat in that restaurant or cafe 
is that they're looking at that hospital. The affordance is that your, your loved one is going to go straight into the hospital. It also says to the residents, you'll be going to the hospital. So I'm, I'm pretty, I don't quite understand what, what they, what they, that what they probably should do is actually put another um, walkway in there and that just goes straight to the crematorium. So they might as well have the trifecta aged care retirement living straight to hospital to the crematorium because, you know, that's basically the affordance. What it actually tells them is that that's what's going to be their trajectory. So this is in, um, in Australia. And this is for a retirement village. This is for people who are 60 or 65. They can live with like-minded neighbors, which is fine, but every need is met. In design, service, security, and care, along with a peace of mind that comes from living in complete comfort in a safe and supportive environment. So basically that tells you that let us care for you. Let us look after you. Um, you know, we'll do everything. You, you don't need to do anything. In fact, on the Retirement Living Council website, it says there is, are no expectations of you to be anywhere or to do anything in particular. So how would you like to have 20 years where there are no expectations of you to be anywhere or to do anything? It gets a bit you know, like where does your meaning and purpose come from? So basically the retirement villages are set up to entertain you, to keep you entertained. So basically in Australia, we set people up to go on holidays for 20 to 30 years, which is a very long time just to play golf and to do nothing. It's also a complete waste of resources. So we as an industry, as researchers, we actually have to take some responsibility for creating and facilitating withdrawal. We're part of it. So we have to really think about what it is that we're doing. We didn't see longevity coming. And for some of us, we don't want it to come because it means that what we're doing, we're, we would lose, um, I guess, our power or we would lose our our agenda if we had to change and, and do it differently. So looking through the lens, how do we best leverage the 30 years of life? Basically, we have to realize that um, the baby boomers are not a blip. There's going to be the same amount of people coming through who are older. So we're going to have this steady stream of older people coming through. So we really have to think quite differently. Health is getting better. So we're, we're healthier and we're um, at all ages. So the 85 plus, they're getting much healthier. So again, we have to prepare for people to be healthy as well as, as delivering support. And what's really interesting is if you have a look at those who um, employment, which is participation rate, the ones that are increasing in their employment are the 65 to 74 year olds. So we might need to actually deliver some infrastructure to support people to continue working maybe differently, but actually provide infrastructure to provide options and opportunities. So overall, age tells us about a person's year of birth and then nothing else. Doesn't tell you anything about me other than how old I am. The future older people will be very different to the present older people. And we will, be, we will age experiencing very different physical, social, economic, and cultural conditions. So those that are currently 85 are, have a very different expectation and experience than those who are 50. And lifestyle expectations, capabilities, and opportunities and constraints directly impact outcomes for individuals and society. So... Assumptions and implications, predictions made on dependency ratio is mistaken if older people are active. And if you assume inactivity of older people, it actually breeds, in a, it breeds inactivity. So basically you get what you ask for. So if you tell people they're gonna be dependent 
They're not going to be active. They, they will sit down and do nothing. And then again, we have to be, we have to accept responsibility for that. So we need a change of thinking. We actually need a change of thinking to think that they stop thinking that there's a peak and then we decline. We need to change our thinking too, that older people don't necessarily grow old. When they stop growing, they become old. You can actually continue to contribute to society up until the day that you die. The picture is of Hilda Desart. I met Hilda many years ago. When she was 60, she decided um, she'd done a whole lot of things. She was a journalist, ran a printing company and so forth. When she was 60, she decided that she was going to be a social worker. So she went and got a, got a degree in social work and had a 20-year had a 20-year career. She did that 20-year career because um, in a wheelchair, and that was because she had mobility issues, but she was a highly effective social worker. And again, she actually put supports around her so that she could engage and contribute up until the day she died. So we need a change of thinking. We need to extend adulthood into our entire life. So rather than becoming an older person or so forth, you don't ever stop being an adult. You stay an adult until moment of death. So we need to change our thinking from aging to longevity. So aging is a medical condition. Longevity is actually about living life and engaging through, through the community. So it's all about lever leveraging how we live, how we learn, how we work, and how we play. And it's setting up that infrastructure so that we can do those things and have expectations. So it's about talking to someone who's 80, oh, I couldn't possibly. Well, I guess the question is why? Why couldn't you possibly? Why couldn't you possibly learn a new skill? Why couldn't you possibly do um, engage in some part-time um, activities to do work or full-time if you wanted to? Playing is very important at all ages. So it's, again, how do we actually set that infrastructure up so that people have those opportunities and can make those choices when they want to? So it's a changing our approach from health and care to basically to participation and support. Fancy if we said, I'm very happy to provide you support. What do we need to do to help you get back on your feet or stay on your feet or to engage? But it's all around support. So we are all the world's future, all of us at all ages. It doesn't matter whether you're three, six, 10, 35, 65, 75, 85, we are all the future of this world. And we all have to take responsibility and contribute and be part of it. So what would happen if concepts such as old or aging or retirement were no longer relevant or used? So I, I challenge you not to use those, those words. It would be interesting to see if you can do it. Not to talk, don't use that word retirement. People can change occupations. People can leave the workforce. Don't use retirement. See, see how you go. What happens if the demand was for support, not care? Just the reframing of what we do. And demand is for infrastructure to facilitate occupation, ability, capability, and value for everyone throughout their life. So what happens if we unlock the economic and social potential of people who are 65 plus rather than tip them over into some sort of burden category? So again, if we want to get a different outcome, we actually have to do it differently. We have to think differently and it starts with us. Have a look at some of the research that you do. Have a look at how you start your grants, do you start with all, oh, there's 25% of people who are socially isolated, you know, and, and it's all around picking up on the negativity of things. What happens if we actually start to build that infrastructure to enhance the good stuff, 
that happen. So again, it actually starts with us as researchers and practitioners. We're the one that has to change and really look at ourselves and think of what we're contributing to it. Because there's the old thing is who wants change? And then who wants to change? So most of us want change, but not many of us want to change. And so it's much easier to pass the change on to others. But the challenge is for us to lead that change and really look at what we're doing and challenge ourselves and our vocabulary and change it. And that's it for me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And um, uh, look, Laurie, I've, I've got notes written all over the place here, but I, I know that there's some questions in the Q&A, so I, I can't take up all of the time. But, you know, thank you so much. I can't um, think of a better way to have ended this series. Um, I, you know, I think um, what was amazing, I was watching the participants join and and, and people just sort of kept coming in and staying in throughout your presentation. So that was that was really lovely. Um, and I just before I move on to the questions, I need to say um, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Chris Rudd, unfortunately couldn't attend tonight, but he actually sent a message and said he really wished that he could have been here, but he's been called away to something else. So, um, you know, he, he has attended the series and I'm sure that he would have really enjoyed tonight's as well and um, the gentleman's an engineer so he would have challenged you on a bunch of stuff um, but look uh, with with no um, without holding stuff up we, we do have some questions here that I'm going to ask uh, I'm just going to move them over to here so um, this is a question from um, Professor Nigel Marsh so he's one of our, our senior staff in the um, psychology space, clinical psychology space. And his question is, can't gates and walls also provide a sense of wanted physical security for those living within them? Look, that's a really interesting question. And I'll address it kind of by telling you about a, a co-design session that we did with a group of residents. Um, there is a, a provider here in Australia who wanted to do something quite different in, our, in their master plan and wanted to open up their retirement village and aged care to the, to the community. And it's in an area that has a number of issues with, um, I guess, some um, socioeconomic issues around, um, I guess, break-ins and some other issues that are in that area. And so the residents and their families, we did some co-design workshops. In the first co-design workshop that we ran, there was probably a hundred people there and we were um, looking at what the, what the, co what the I guess, what the, the master plan might look at. And literally that they were absolutely, they almost had placards out that they wanted to keep the walls. Um, they, they were fighting to keep the walls. They said that they needed to keep people out. They need to keep that sense of security. They need to keep all of that there because they just weren't safe without it. Now, we went through a whole lot of exercises with them to really tease out what it is that they wanted. How did they want to live their lives and what it is that would create that sense of community? And we showed them an, um, some photographs around, um, you did it through some pictures of different things and got them to talk about it. And there was one picture of a street that was with nobody on it, basically, because it was within a gated community and there was nobody on the street. It was very, a very quiet street. Then we showed them other pictures where the streets were very vibrant places. There was um, community markets, there was street vendors, there was people walking around and so forth. And we talked about if you fall or you get into trouble, which street would you want to be on? And they talked about the importance of actually being safer and feeling safer on the streets where there were, where there were people and things that were happening. 
So we talked about, okay, so, you know, you want to be, you want to be in a place where there's people around, where you can go out, where you feel safe at night. So we actually did a whole lot of um, work with landscaping, with lighting, with design that directed people to go in certain directions. So it kept, um, and we dealt with crime in a very different way. So by the end of it, we actually were able to do, and they've just delivered that, they've just built it, it's just been built. And there's not a, a gate or a, a wall in sight. Now the building is security coded, but there's no, um, what they did is they opened it up to the community and actually made it safer because they brought in community people to do gardening. They brought in um, the, the school, they connected the school in with it. So it's a very, it's a big hub of activity. So again, I think you have to really understand what it is you're trying to do. What are you trying to feel safe from? So that's what they, um, so they actually feel safer now with that, that heavy activity. It's exciting. They go out, they see people and do things. They're far safer than they were in the streets where nobody was on. If they fell, no one would find them for a few hours. So I think it's about how we think about safety and what it is that you're trying to achieve. A wall doesn't necessarily make you safe. As someone said, a young person can jump a wall in two minutes flat. So again, you're going to think about what you're trying to achieve. Thanks for that. Um, the, the next question is from Denise Dillon. So um, Denise says, uh, Nick, uh, Palmerini, one of our other healthy aging speakers, also spoke about positive influence of having or finding meaning in life. Um, and it's interesting that Eric Erickson's stage theory includes the stage of integrity versus despair for those over 65 um, and considered that this is a period of flux. Given that this idea has been around for so long, um, she says it, it beggars belief that we haven't been better prepared to deal with this over time with better transitional plans for healthy aging. It appears that the autonomy is another important feature that we've missed from planning. Um, and then she apologized for not being able to articulate it. And it's, and it's interesting before you answer that, um, I'm, I had just written a question. So I was madly scribbling away while you were talking. And one of the things that, that I often say, which I think um, Denise is also talking about here is, Society sets the rules by which we live, you know, and you, you took us on this lovely journey and I'm surprised that, you know, we, we live in a generation where we have people alive that, went, that, that were able to go to school and wrote on slate um, boards, and my parents being one of them, and we now can buy and sell in cryptocurrency, which blows my mind. I've got no idea what it is, but anyway, it's, uh, it, it's that. Um, so... Really, this is what Denise is talking about, I think, you know, it, it, we're, we're still relying on these theories that are, that are there, but we're not changing to represent the society that we currently live in. And yet we have that power. We set the rules by which we live. So when you said it's up to us to, to change the rhetoric, to change the, the, the picture and the vision and the optics of what we see represents us now. I, I, I'm gonna throw that over to you because I've kind of um, jumped in on, on Denise's platform here. So, you know, please answer hers. Mine's just musings. Well, absolutely. It's interesting because um, I think Erickson was one of the very first um, theorists I learned about when I was doing my master's or I did a, yeah, in gerontology, I learned about him and so forth. And I agree with you, Denise, it, it actually just begs belief as to why we haven't thought about meaning and purpose. And I was talking about meaning and purpose today with another group of people. And, it, and we just, we seem to forget and we seem to, I guess, disconnect that. Um, and, you know, with the same group of people, what was really interesting when we were doing the master planning, so I'll come back to that group as well. I was on a table with about, oh, about 10 women and they were over, they were over 85. 
and they wanted young people to come into the retirement village because they wanted to, they were, they said they were tired of running the, the class, the, the, the group activities and so forth. And it was time for them to take a break. It was really, you know, it was their right to, to you know, rest and relax and to have a have time off. So I asked them, I said, okay, tell me, at what age do I get to be a princess and sit down and do absolutely nothing and everyone actually look around, look, look after me? And it was quite funny, their reaction. They actually then went, oh, actually, we need to get off our backsides and start running these things and be, you know, get back engaged because who said at 85 you get the right to drop out? Who said that? Like who made up that rule? So I think it's about we really need to challenge those assumptions that we've had. And it because Erickson, he, he, he flagged it years ago. <laughs> and so I, you know, and Kerry O'Brien, if you looked at him when he, he didn't retire, when he left um, the ABC, he didn't retire. He actually went on to another career and became a novelist. And he actually framed it that way. So everyone has the right to change jobs. Everyone has the right to have, you know, to do different things. But who has the right to sit down and do nothing? Okay, next question. Um, and this one's from, from Denise again. Um, and she says, it seems that uh, one of the next steps will involve a lot of tech mediated activity. Uh, I wonder if we should be thinking even further ahead now to skip ahead to the point where tech assisted devices might be completely integrated into living. And what she's saying is across the lifespan. So not just at this end of life stage, but from the get go. So yeah. what, what do you think about that? Yeah, look, I think as long as we actually, um, I agree, I think, and I think tech is going to give us some amazing things to do. Absolutely amazing things to do. And it'll help us. And like our life has changed. And, you know, when I first started working, I sent telegrams to, to connect with people and now I message them. So it's, it's bizarre. So I think that what we need to make sure is that our lives are, are actually led by our lifestyle and what we want to do. And they're supported by tech. The only thing that concerns me about tech is that I have a lot of pit people pitching ideas of tech to me, and it's they're, they're actually a, a solution looking for a problem. So I think we just have to make sure that the tech doesn't drive our life, but we drive our life, and it's our lifestyle. We have to connect with humans. We have to be human, and, and tech can support that absolutely, and it's about how we make sure that tech is supporting not leading. Yeah, I look, I, I couldn't agree more. And this brings us to sort of that big sort of research question of who's wagging the tail here? Is the tail wagging the dog or is the dog wagging the tail? And, um, you know, what, one of the great things that, that I know that you not only embrace, but you, you do, it's very visible in your research profile, is it is industry-led problem solution. So it's, it's industry coming up. So in this case, it is the people, it, it, it is this group driving it saying, we need to change some of these things, not uh, researchers, which was old school of, hey, we've got a great solution to a problem that we believe that you have. And if you don't, well, give us some money and we'll, we'll fix it for you anyway. And, and that's wonderful in this space that we flipped that coin. Um, and, and, and we're still sort of getting there in a lot of ways, but I think, you know, industry saying let us work with you and let us tell you tell you what's going on and then you help us because you you're the brains trust in here and and then we can go there so you a really nice question from Lil may um and i i may get this wrong so forgive me if i do but i think Lil's from the philippines um i hope to see more of these theories and new alternative perspectives in our books and schools and learning materials so that we can educate young people and older people rather than continuing to believe in the teachings and the traditional mindset. So it's more of a statement, yeah. um, I suppose. But I might actually leap in there because the, the importance of intergenerational, Karen, you and I have talked about that so often because older people don't live in a vacuum. Younger people don't live in a vacuum. It's actually about how do we look at theories that it's about how do we not only it's about lifespan theories, but it's that intergenerational connectivity. It's about how do we engage together 
um, and really create that vibrant community together. Yeah. So it's about how do we connect? Yeah, I, look, a, absolutely. And we've got a couple of more comments. I know that we're running out of time, but questions just, or statements keep coming in. Um, this is from Gail Hazelwood. I ask people how often they feel not their age. It's amazing how many people uh, in their 80s feel 35. Technology and loss need to be introduced slowly. Uh, and it's easy and inexpensive. And currently we have basic inadequate, uh, even a basic inadequacy for text to speech. Um, it's too confronting because it lacks the human connection. Uh, we have another comment from the only short comment, not a question. Fantastic presentation, Laurie. Thanks very much indeed. You've definitely given me a lot to think about. Um, I'll try my best to use more appropriate words to describe myself and others. Well, Leonie, you know, I think I think all of us using rhetoric is is um, a learned behaviour, and we we as a nation and nations and and a global society need to change. I suppose some of these things. Uh, one from um, Pierre Boone. Thank you, Professor Byers and Karen, for such an insightful session. Um, and one from Maria Louis. Hi, I'm Louis from the Philippines. I'm interested in conducting the same study you did online with 50 to 94 year olds. Um, is there a paper you have published uh, that you could do in the Philippines? Look, you know, um, please contact us, uh, Maria. We will happily put you in, in contact with Professor Byers and you can, um, you know, ha have that dialogue and she will, you know, I, I know I work with her, she will do what she can to help you um, in this space in your country because it's, it's all of our countries are so different Yet in this space, there are a number of commonalities. Um, you know, I, my 83-year-old mother on the weekend told me that she wished she had a chance to ride a skateboard. I have got no idea what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> but um, may, maybe I'll take a skating. Let's, let's just see. Um, but look, I, I know that we are at the end of tonight. Um, and Eric has just jumped on and said, thank you so much for attending, everybody. I need to say a couple of very quick thank yous, which I will do, um, you know, for the team that make this happen, this series happen, a huge thank you for Erica and Vinay. Of course, these are the heartbeat behind all of the operations and they make this thing seamless. Um, thank you both very much for all you do. Um, your satisfaction surveys just popped up because I know people have to go. Huge thank you to Associate Professor Denise Dillon, who's the driver of this initiative. Uh, Denise and I sat down at the beginning and she said, who are we going to ask? And we named, we went for lofty heights. And I believe that we, we got that and we have had excellent speakers. And of course, also um, to my research team and my research assistant, uh, Belle, thank you so much for all we do. I said to Laurie tonight, this is such an amazing series and my team always look, myself and the presenters look great. And tonight, you know, we have not failed. So it's never anything without the panelists. You, you know, you hit the 70 mark tonight. So thank you so much, uh, Laurie. And thank you everybody for coming. And please do the survey and good night. And Laurie, you're welcome to stay online if you wanna for a minute, but we'll stop okay. the share. Thanks everyone.